Hey, Jorge, we are live. We're live on the internet. I love it. The internet machine. <laughs> you're, looking, you're looking good in color, too, I must say, my friend. Yeah, like grandpa glasses? <laughs> no, no. You look great. I've, I've been watching your stuff for a long time, so I'm super excited that you're, that you're joining us today. And yeah, uh, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think so too. We got some cool stuff to share with uh, your followers and mine, and I think uh, they'll learn a little bit about tennis IQ today. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I know that uh, my students could definitely use that. I could use that. I think everybody could use that. Sure. So we're we're. Oh, I got to go to my channel. I just was hearing myself in the background. There's always technical stuff. We got Alan uh, already said what's up, what's happening, Pete, and okay. Jim says let's go. So right. we have pe people who can hear us, which is pretty cool. We're excited about that. Nice. Yeah. So uh, how long you been teaching tennis? Well, it's been a while now. I'm, I'm in my 33rd year of teaching. I uh, started out pretty young. I did it right out of college. And uh, I've been doing it for 33 years now. Uh, my current role is, is more, so I'm not totally on the court anymore. I'm done. I'm in the court anywhere between five and 10 hours a week. Um, obviously, I got some online uh, instruction sites going. But yeah, I got, I counted it up. A good friend of mine told me, you should count up and try to project how many hours you taught. And I, it's not perfect, but when I go back and I kind of remember how much I taught because I was, a real grinder. I mean, this is pretty common in our industry where coaches get busy and they teach 50 hours a week on the court, which first maybe decade, but I've taught over 63,000 hours on the court. Wow. Over that time. So I've learned a few things. I've messed up some people and I've, you know, I've learned how to make, fix those mess ups. But yeah, I've seen pretty much everything there is to see on a tennis court as a coach. That is pretty cool. And I can tell that from your instruction. I, I really love your stuff. You do a great job. And um, so I'm excited. We see we got a number of people coming in right now. We've got, uh, I think, over 50 people. And uh, I just want to let everybody know that uh, we're happy to have you here. If you look over to the right of the video, that's where you can chat and say hello. We're going to have a, uh, a question and answer section at the end of this broadcast. So definitely hang around. Also, Jorge is going to give you a pretty cool PDF that once you go through, if you stick around for this whole thing, you're going to want it because it's got a lot of great information and he's going to give it to you guys <coughs> absolutely free, which is really, really cool. So um, you guys are in the right place at the right time today because we are – uh, live here with Jorge Capistani. He is a USP tape master professional. And today he's going to teach us something that I think a lot of us need to learn. I know a lot of my students can get obsessed about technique and making sure that the technique is perfect. But unless you have a really good plan on, on how to use it, you know, as far as what are the right shots to use and, and, and how do you play different opponents and all that kind of thing, it's not going to do you much good. So, um, what we're going to be discussing today are five things. So first, we're going to discuss three levels of tennis IQ. Can you let us know a little bit what, what, that, what does that mean? Yeah, so the way I describe tennis IQ is like a 30,000-foot view of strategy. Strategy is a little bit uh, more specific. Tennis IQ is just your general understanding of how the game is played, the arts of competing in a tennis match. And um, I've been able to... You know, once I had that idea, I mean, I, it made sense to me, it makes sense to my students, but I, I learned that I had to package it so that they could understand it. You know, it wasn't just enough for me to have it. So by breaking it down into levels and packing, packaging it, uh, I'm going to show you in the PowerPoint that we go through today, uh, the three levels, what they are, but, you know, you'll see that a lot of players get stuck at level two, and very few players ever reach that third level of tennis IQ. Once we go through it, I think people will kind of have an aha moment, like, wow, yeah, that totally makes sense. But, yeah, I'm not doing it at all. So, yeah, tennis IQ is kind of like a, a big overview of overall general tennis strategy, tennis knowledge, if you're winning with your head versus winning with your strokes. I like it. I like it. And I know I know all my people want to get to level three, and I want them to get there. So uh, uh, next is you're going to give us five awareness drills. Now, what, what is an awareness drill, and why should we want to learn what they are? 
Yeah, so once I had the concept of the three levels of tennis IQ, and then part two for me is I needed to come up with some drills so that my players could execute, kind of like to learn it. Like these are the, this is the vehicle in which I use to teach tennis IQ. Uh, an awareness drill is just something that, that's my word, awareness just means that I'm going to have them do a drill, and they're going to just become aware of stuff. I'm not necessarily looking to tell them what they're learning. I'm just going to be asking a lot of questions. And uh, after I, you know, it took me a long time to come up with five and tweak them and change them and throw some out and put some new ones in. But it's all tied to the three levels of tennis IQ and the, and the five awareness drills just help them kind of come to their own realization. And many times, a whole bunch of times, uh, they'll start to be like, well, I never knew that about myself. I never knew how, you know, what strike zone I hit in. I never knew where my ball was landing. I never paid attention to where my opponent was standing. So. Uh, I call them awareness drills, but those are the uh, those are basically the delivery vehicle of which I use to train the the building tennis IQ levels. Very, very cool. Very cool. We we did get unfortunately this is live, so we did get some people saying that they are having trouble that it's buffering and freezing. So uh, screen freezing me too. Wow, it looks good on my end. Yeah, it looks uh, good for me too. Very That's strange. Lie, hang on, hang with us, guys. We'll get it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what else to do, but uh, all right. Number three is you're going to talk about how to run missions. Now that sounds like top secret stuff. How how do we run yeah. missions? So missions are another name for tactics or things to try in the court. Um, you know, we all have different amount of tactics that we can use. Strategy, in my view, is kind of like a a little bit. Of an umbrella, and then this, the tactics you use is regarding your strategy. So, if my strategy is to play from the baseline, my tactics might be steady baseline, loopy baseline, slice, slice a lot, you know, anything I want. But uh, missions, I think, are a better word because they you can accomplish a mission and still lose the point. So, I'm trying to get our players to think less about tactics because that immediately ties them to the scoreboard which a lot of people freak out about. And I say, let's just get our mind off the scoreboard uh, and let's do a mission. So I, like if I were coaching you, Peter, and you were one of my students, um, I'd be doing it against another person. You'd be sparring with another person. And I might give you a mission, you know, for example, to move them to a certain spot on the court. Uh, and then just having that mission assigned then opens up a ton of dialogue and good coaching opportunities. Because like if I say, hey, I want to see you, Peter, what can you do to make that guy back up? See if you can push him back towards the baseline or really even further back by the fence. Well, a lot of players don't know how to do that. Uh, so bam, there I have some options. So missions, and there's a whole bunch of missions. They're basically another name for tactics that you can deploy while you play. Um, and the, nice, the reason I like them better than tactics is because um, I, you'll see when we get to that section, we're not going to be talking so much about the points that you win as much as how many times you accomplish your mission. Yeah. It's, my, okay. it's my way of getting players a wider um, range of deployable things they can do. Okay, cool. H hold on one second. What I'm going to do, because everybody's saying that it's constantly buffering, and so I'm going to log off the internet for a second and then come back on. We may have to even restart the broadcast. Uh, okay. But almost everybody is saying that it's not coming through. And, I, and I'm starting to see it on my end buffer too. So I'm going to disconnect. And I need to go. All right, are you still there? I'm here. All right. Well, hopefully that did something. I I I don't know. Maybe this is just a a YouTube problem today, which is yeah. I checked my other screen, and I'm you know we look good. I'm very frustrated with this, but uh, what can we do? Yeah. All right. You look you look fine again. Look, somebody just said it works. Okay. Good. All well, right. <laughs> ah, it's never a dull moment. Well, it's buffering again in front of me too. Jeez, I'm going to have to blame YouTube on this one. Um, okay, <coughs> number four is you're going to learn how to play quality points. I think that's super important. Lots of times I'm proud of my student when they lose a point and they look all disappointed 
disappointed and depressed uh, because they don't seem to get that they just played a great point. And if they keep playing that, they're going to win more than they lose. What do you think about that? Yeah, you pretty much described it right there. Um, so many times our players, the only way they judge a point is either one of two ways. If they won or lost, or what happened on the last shot of maybe a 20-ball rally, and they only judge that last ball. So the idea of quality points is getting them off of that scoreboard and more concentrating on how to play. And there, I've come up with a couple clever ways of scoring that so it promotes quality play versus you know just worrying about the of the scoreboard and it's very that section by the way is super eye-opening because as a coach when I start asking my players to rate themselves uh, it's really common that they're way off what I think what I think and what they think are two completely different things of what a quality point is and wham there's my chance to coach and, and help them out I think that's great you know so getting them more focused on you know they have their own little scoring system so that they don't get all bent out of shape if they are you know, the tactics aren't particularly working, you know, with ultimately winning the point. But you and I, know the more they do the right thing, that it's going to show through in matches eventually. Yeah. Um, number five is, and I love this idea. I think I know where you're going with this. And I talk to my, my students all the time about this, is between point techniques. What are between point techniques? I love it. Well, I... You know, I have an admission. When I was a junior player, I thought the time between points was just a rest period. So all that really mattered is the time during the point. We know the average tennis point lasts between five and seven seconds. We know the average rest period is between 20 and 25 seconds. So there's a lot more of that time. But I learned as a coach and later on in my career that that between time um, point or that time between points is actually a, another performance. I mean, I start my performance at the beginning of the of the point, the actual point, and I'm performing by running and hitting and doing all that stuff. But as soon as that ball goes out of play, immediately another performance starts. And just looking at that time between points as a time to perform and showing them what to do is really how you want to look at it. It's not a rest period. It's not, um, you know, if you watch the pros, there's always a bunch of really obvious things they all tend to do. It's not by accident that they're just all doing certain things. So scripting that between point time is really important and we'll show you a little bit of what we do with that i think that's huge and that that is a skill that people have to work on as well and it's and it can be a tough buy-in and and i love that you're going to talk about it today um so i've i've gotten a couple notes on youtube some good news that that things seem to be going better we hope that they continue to go better uh, we have over 70 people on the call right now. And uh, so now let me tell you before, uh, Jorge's going to take over here in a second. He's going to take over the screen. And uh, But before he does, I want to tell you why you're lucky to be on this call with him. He's a master pro with the USPTA and PTR. There's only 10 people in the world that can say that. And he's one of them on the call today. So we're lucky to have him here. He's been a six-time Michigan pro of the year. I've been a one-time uh georgia pro of the year but not six times that's pretty good uh that's amazing actually uh uspta pro of the year that means the whole country well actually that even goes beyond the country doesn't it yeah that one does so yeah it. yeah so uspta and that's basically the most esteemed you know teaching credential you can get well he's been the pro of the year within our industry so we all look up to him he's been on the tennis channel He's had his own show. You did your own, uh, what are the names, On Court, right, with USPTA? Yeah, exactly, USPTA, great organization. Um, they have a series, a show series called On Court with USPTA, and I was lucky enough to do three separate shows that aired at different times on the Tennis Channel, and that was a lot of fun. It was really, really cool. Yeah, and if we have any coaches or, you know, our students, they love to go out and do drills and are always looking to keep things fresh. That's why they follow us online, Jorge, and he's got – the best drill site in the world, literally, like in the world, it's called Tennis Drills TV, and he has subscriptions in over 65 countries, and uh, so that's pretty exciting, and also he's got a fairly new website, it's been out there for a while now, JorgeCapistani.com, which is geared more towards the recreational player, it's also an incredible site, so make sure you go check all that out. Uh, so let's go right into it. I'm going to let you take over the screen and uh, you're going to discuss the three levels of tennis IQ and I'm going to shut my mouth. 
All right, let me get uh, <clears throat> this baby pulled up right here. It might take me a second. Um, are you seeing my slide point right now? Or are you still? All right, I think I have to do a little. I got to get off of the screen share. All right, right here. Um, I'm going to get my guy, Kenny. Um, you always go to the green. Yeah, uh, I see it. And I says, uh, screen one, I don't want to share. So. Now, there you oh, go. Okay. You did it. Now I'm getting closer. Now we should be able to see it. There we go. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> let me just kind of start at the beginning. Building 10S IQ is basically a concept. I did turn it into a course I sold a few years ago. But it really was born out of my frustration of feeling that as a tennis coach, <clears throat> I had a lot of players that I was working with that had developed pretty good strokes, but they were not connecting the dots between getting wins. And the more I dug into it, the more I realized that, you know, I've created a nice little army here of ball strikers that look quite good, but they're not happy. They're not winning as much as they should. And I didn't think they were winning as much as they should. So this was just a journey I started probably 15 years ago, and I've been tweaking the delivery system ever since. And uh, each year I think it gets a little better, and it has helped a lot of my players finally kind of learn how to actually win a tennis match and not just hit a tennis ball. So I'm going to go to the next screen here. <clears throat> Here's the premise. Um, many rec players feel like they don't win as much as they should. So if you ask, you know, 100 rec players, what do you think? Do you win as much as you should? The, the truth is a lot of them don't. They're, they're not real happy with their results. Um, and as coaches, we, you know, we feel our players think that way a lot. Number, point number two here is that uh, many rec players play the wrong way, but they don't even know it. Uh, one of the issues is point three here. They, they're chasing the perfect stroke, which I think is fool's gold. And before I have people freak out because I like coaches, you know, say technique, what are you talking about? So technique is super important. Um, but what I find is that if you're going to take technique to the nth degree and just constantly every lesson for 20 years straight, you're just tweaking and tweaking and tweaking technique, you're going to miss the boat. Um, you have to get, I have a phrase called, um, range of acceptability and as soon as I get a player where their technique is in that range of acceptability there's no flaws then I'm moving on a strategy and a lot of players don't want to do that they make a mistake and they think no no I need better strokes um, so that's one thing the fourth thing is that serial drillers are often the worst at a club so I think what happens this is particularly a junior problem that the world has changed from when I've been teaching 33 years back in the day when I ran a group lesson, the kids couldn't wait to play. Let us play. Let us play points. And now we have these serial drillers, which are their professional lesson takers. It's good for a lot of pros. You make good money, but they just take lesson upon lesson upon lesson, and they never to play a match, so they don't take a quiz, if you will. Matches are just quizzes and tests. They, they test how you're improving. Uh, there's no such thing as failure. It's just feedback. And if you can... Uh, Look at it that way, you're more likely to play. So uh, adults do a little better, in my opinion, in that area, but juniors in particular are really bad at avoiding match play. Um, <clears throat> so what is um, tennis? The way I like to explain tennis is it's 50% chess at 90 miles an hour and 50% poker. So here's what I mean by that. The chess part means if you're playing ch tennis properly, you're thinking two or three shots deep into a point. Uh, Oh, sorry, I went too, went too far. In other words, you're not just going out to the serve and just with no plan. Um, but that does happen where people have no plan. I call that winging it. Uh, and then the poker part is um, has to do with between points. And, you know, I have a little story here. I, I don't play poker per se, but I watch ESPN a lot. And occasionally I'll see on ESPN a bunch of people playing poker. And it's interesting to me that that's on ESPN. But what I notice is that these guys are inside a dark, basically, you know, casino. And even though they're inside, they're wearing hoodies, they're wearing sunglasses, they are super concerned with showing any emotion whatsoever uh, because they might give away, you know, what, what kind of hand they have. So I look at that as a great example for tennis players. Most tennis players are pretty bad poker players. In other words, you can watch them between points, and just by watching them, even if it's through a window, you can tell if they're winning or losing. They're, they're showing a lot. So you, you get that so far? 
it's awesome stuff. And I love, I love that idea of the poker player. Yeah, and I wanted to uh, make sure I could hear. Uh, so I'm going to keep going. So uh, when does this happen? In my opinion, the chess part happens kind of before the point, a little bit during the point. The poker part for sure happens, <clears throat> you know, mostly between the points. <clears throat> so, But I like that poker analogy uh, because when you explain it that way, I've had a lot of people kind of go, ah, yeah, I guess you're right. I, I would be kind of a crappy poker player. Uh, so let's get into this levels of IQ. This is kind of the whole uh, point. So here's how I define it. The three levels, um, level one is when the player, all they can really deal with is the, the player and the ball, and that's about it. These are often beginner players or they're new to the game. If you're working as a coach with these kind of players, it's all about teaching them. They have to understand how does this thing work? How do I receive the ball properly? How do I line up for it? How do I send it back? How do I recover? So level one, all you're really going to ask the player to do is just kind of understand the relationship between them and the ball, and it's kind of highly technical, kind of beginnerish. But with level two, you're going to you're going to keep those two things. Plus, <clears throat> now these players they're able to start making proper decisions regarding their own side of the court. So in other words, they understand that if they're if they're moving forward inside the baseline, hitting a forehand, that's quite different than moving backwards up against the back fence hitting a forehand. So they're starting to include their own side of the net in the decision process. And then level three of tennis IQ, which I firmly believe happens a lot at the pro level, is they can do the two things above, but now these folks are actually pretty good at understanding the opponent's side. They actually draw their attention to the other side. And now they're, they're understanding that, hey, if I'm playing against Peter and Peter's up against the back fence, that means I should be doing certain things. But if Peter's moving forward, hitting a, a, a sitting forehand, and now he's moved inside the court, that's totally different. So those are that's the 30,000-foot view of tennis, the three levels as I describe them. And then now that I had this idea, I had to go further and say, okay, how am I going to deliver this? Not only verbally, I don't want my people to understand it, just, you know, I want them to understand it, but that's not enough. I have to teach them how to train it. So let's keep going here. Um, and I think at this point, it's important to kind of get on the same page. So I have what I refer to it as my teaching system, but there's a few things that everybody in my club or I've ever worked with, we have to be on the same page because I'm often teaching in this regard. So you can see in the far left there, if you take the, the service box, um, I call that zone one and zone two. So that's what basically really short balls. Um, and then if you go to the middle slide, uh, I take the no man's land and I divide that into zone three and four. Uh, and then way to the right, you can see I divide the area behind the baseline all the way to the back fence. I call that zone five and six. So essentially, that's important to know because I'm going to be referring to it. Um, it's not super complicated, frankly. It's a nice little easy way to look at the court. But those I call the six zones of the court. Uh, and you'll see how important they are as we get going through the, the slides here. Um, so the number one killer of tennis IQ, if I were to take a pause, is that fo players that focus solely on ball striking skills. And um, I'll just kind of give my two cents on this. So part of the reason that happens so much is sometimes it's the fault of the player because they're addicted to technique. And if the coach tells them, hey, Peter, you really missed that shot because your footwork wasn't right, you were lazy up to the ball, <clears throat> A lot of players don't want to hear that. They they really would love to hear a technical <clears throat> tip. For example, you know, hey Peter, keep that elbow up a little higher, and that'll calm your wrist down. And that they love to hear because it's like a quick fix. But the reality is, um, focusing only on ball striking skills is going to not necessarily translate into winning. Uh, the second line I have here is the player with the better strokes often loses in tennis. Uh, and if you play tennis, you know that's for sure. It's not always the guy that has the best-looking strokes that wins, particularly at the club level. Um, so early on in my years as a coach, <clears throat> I tended to be highly technical. Um, I had a lot of good players. Uh, well, let me, re let me restate that. I had a ton of players that looked good, but they couldn't win. Uh, it wasn't even a few years into it that I started having these kind of uneasy feelings like what is it with my players they all look good but they can't string a win together they're losing way more matches than they should and that was kind of what got me started on this journey but those three points i make there i think are universally true wherever i go i've been lucky enough to go speak and you know 
in China and Australia and Mexico and Norway and at Wimbledon last year. I'm always talking to coaches and how's it going with your players? What's what works? What doesn't work? And a lot of coaches and players would agree with these three statements here. <clears throat> these are things that kill tennis IQ. Um, so we had talked about the five awareness games. So these are the games that I use to deliver it. So if I just sit here and talk with a player and explain kind of like what we're doing right now, uh, you're going to get head knowledge, right? Hopefully people are following along the concepts I'm sharing. <clears throat> but that's not going to make you better. you got to actually now go out on the court and learn this thing. So I've come up with these five awareness games. You can call them drills. And I'm going to dig into these a little bit <clears throat> here as we go. So if I go to the next slide, um, let's talk about tennis IQ level one. If you recall, it's uh, the player in the ball. Uh, it's all about reception skills. This is what I think when I'm working with a um, – a level one player, like a new player, I want to make sure they, they understand how to set up properly because if they can't set up, I don't care how good their um, sending skills, their shot skills are, they have to get there first. Um, and then the danger here is spending all your time uh, working on your sending techniques, and I think that's where a lot of us coaches maybe mess up our players. You take a beginner and you just put them on a ball machine and they're sending, 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 sending. And they end up having a pretty good stroke, but they don't know how to receive. So as soon as the ball goes live, and now it's an actual ball, they play tons worse, and then they start feeling bad about themselves and so on. Uh, the last point on this slide is that tennis is a sport of sending and receiving. Uh, and at this stage, I want them to master the uh, receiving. And I think that's a big thing that most people don't get, that we t tennis players and coaches think it's all about the sending. Uh, but before you send, you receive. And definitely what you receive should determine what you send. Uh, you find the same thing when you coach, Peter? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, this is, yeah, this, this is really, good, really stuff good stuff because, because you're right. So, you're right. Many, so many people, people focus, focus on, on, on um, I'm hearing a lot of feedback when I'm saying, but can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. Perfect. Okay. Uh, but, but so many of the kids and the adults, they, they want to focus all the time on, on their, uh, and I know coaches, they want to focus all the time on their technique. And one of the worst things they don't want to hear, you really, you really hit it on the head when it's like, well, you didn't, you didn't miss that because you don't have nice strokes. You missed that because you didn't, you know, get your feet in proper positions of the ball. And, and uh, yeah. so absolutely good stuff. Keep going. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now let's talk about strike zones because this is a major uh, importance here. This is uh, the strike zones. You see a little, um, Stick figure here. I basically define the strike zones as four levels, and you can see them there. Uh, strike zone one, whether it's your forehand or backhand side, it's just below your knees. So typically you're hitting slice balls there. Uh, strike zone two is right by your thigh between your knees and hips. That's a pretty comfortable spot for most people. Strike zone three is up more by your torso. And then strike zone four is up above your head. And I've learned when it comes to strike zones, people are very, very – unaware. I mean, they, they're clueless. They don't know where they don't, they couldn't tell you most players what their most common strike zone is. Um, in some cases, sadly, they can't even tell you what their best strike zone is. So if you look at the next screen here, um, and I encourage you to kind of, uh, one of the giveaways we're going to do is give you the slideshow. It's a, it's a really 31 page slideshow, a uh, slide thing that we're going to be giving away. But this is a huge thing. If you don't do anything other than this as a player, or a coach, um, you want to do an audit. So if you look at the player one on the left, this is this is actually me. <laughs> this is what I would give myself. So on my forehand side, strike zone four, um, way up high by my right shoulder, that's a B. I'm pretty good at there. And in torso area on my forehand side, I give myself an A. Um, by strike zone two, I give myself you know um, a, a A. I'm pretty good there. And by strike zone um, one at the bottom, it's a C. Now, I have a one-handed backhand, so a high backhand to me is a, is a problem. That's the like weakest shot. You can just basically see. But one of the really best exercises I've done with my players is to have this printable and then have them fill in their own and then also do it for their opponent. <clears throat> now, you and I could probably put Roger Federer on this scale 
and we could probably come up. Now he's Roger Federer, so it's going to be a lot of good stuff. But you would definitely know that, yeah, strike zone four, the backhand side, that's going to be a lower grade for Roger. Uh, this is how Rafa has determined to play him. So this strike zone audit is very important, and a lot of people that play a lot of tennis never really even think about it. They don't even think about, you know, the strike zone on their side of, uh, of the body. They're just thinking about sending it. So that has been quite helpful. Um, so <clears throat> here's some examples of different strike zones. You see on the far left, Novak's, this is actually return of serve that kicked up, so he's hitting it way up there in strike zone four. Uh, in the middle is Federer. He's got a sweet one right in his, uh, right in his wheelhouse there, uh, strike zone three. And then over to the uh, far right is uh, Sharapova. <clears throat> you can actually see the balls on the strings, and that's the perfect spot for her, nice and comfortable. Uh, so that's just an example of what happens in the pro level. So <clears throat> let's get into a drill. I'm talking here level one, and we're talking the strike zone coding awareness drill. Um, here's how you would do it, because I want you to be able to, to have some usable stuff here. I don't want to just lecture. So this is something you can actually try on the court uh, for yourself or your students. Uh, basically, you're going to swire back and forth. So imagine Peter and I are hitting back and forth. And the goal is every time um, I hit the ball, right at the moment of impact, I yell out aloud what strike zone it was. So in this example, Federer will be hitting three. And right when he hits it, three. And then it goes over to Maria. And Maria it bounces. And then right when she hits it, she says three. And then just kind of go back and forth. So a couple things. It's important to say it out loud. Um, because what's going to happen is you're going to get some subliminal training here. And you'll find something out. If you watch me present live, this is one of the things I always do. And I promise you that if you have, if you do this back and forth for five or ten minutes, it's going to become evident really clearly what is the most common strike zone, uh, which I can tell you right now, a little cheat, it's going to be three. Most players, when they hit back and forth, are making contact in strike zone three. But they wouldn't know that unless they went through that drill. Um, so that's why I love that drill so much. And there's, a, I think, level um, <clears throat> two. So let's talk about level two. Remember, that's all about our side of the court. These players are typically more experienced. Uh, their decision-making skills are more advanced. And I'm going to show you some drills for that. So um, here's what some, some of the decision-making expands to. So now, besides them and the ball, they kind of understand the technical part. Now they're aware of where they're standing on the court. They are aware if their body's going up, back, or stay, so their body's momentum. Uh, they're aware where the ball's landing on their side of the court. They're aware of if they have an easy strike zone or a difficult strike zone. They're aware of that. And, the and they're aware of the difficulty of the incoming shot from the opponent. Those are all things that the pros naturally you know, are aware of, and they factor in. Many club players, they don't factor any of this stuff in. They just kind of go out there and say, well, Coach Jorge, I'm an aggressive baseliner, and dang it, I don't care what you say. I'm That's my style, and I'm playing it. So regardless of what they get, they just wail away. <clears throat> and sometimes it works, and quite often it doesn't. So the idea here of level two is that, hey, listen, we're going to start thinking here uh, and doing a lot more smart things instead of just what you like. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. <clears throat> Here's my, my takeaway drill for level two. It's my favorite, one of my favorite drills. So you can see I got two players sparring back and forth. You can see the, the depth in zones there. One, two, three, four. Four is way back at the net. So I'm going to have you, in this drill, you're going to just hit back and forth. Back and forth you go. Every time the ball lands on my side, <clears throat> my side, I'm going to yell out what zone it landed in. So you can see I have one of our pros here, Mika, on the bottom of the screen. She would be yelling out three because the ball just landed on her side in zone three. And if she sends it back, the other guy over there, he's another one of my coaches, he would be saying whatever number it landed there. So this is the second uh, drill, okay? Um, the first one was sparring back and forth and becoming aware of your strike zones. And then the second one is sparring back and forth and becoming aware of your depth. I call it the depth coding drill, uh, drill number one. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm going to go up again. So if I could just take a quick pause, because this isn't in the – in the thing, but one of the things I, the last few times I've presented, uh, I've kind of do just these first two drills. I do strike code or strike zone coding and I do depth coding. 
And I don't tell the players what I think it's going to be. I just let them experience it. And with, literally, probably 10 times out of 10, after they spar for a while, they say, well, Coach Jorge, my most common strike zone was strike zone three. Uh, and that's something they just became aware of. I didn't tell them. And then when it comes to this depth code, they would say, you know, now that I've done it, I think the most common one is strike or depth area three. So think of this. The most common strike zone in your body is, is three by your torso. And the most common place that it stands or lands is zone three. That alone doesn't seem earth-shattering, but let me kind of explain it a different way. If I had a student, and they had a big tournament tomorrow, um, and that student came to me and said, hey, coach, I got state finals tomorrow for high school. I'm feeling bad. I, I don't, my timing, you know, and that's, if my job would be to make that player feel good about his strokes as soon as possible, but one of the tricks I would do as a coach is I would take them out to the court and I would set them up on a ball machine. And my goal would be to get them their timing fixed and make them feel good about themselves. All right. So you with me so far? Mm -hmm. Now watch this. Here's the dangerous part. If I was doing, let's say this girl on the bottom, I want to fix her. I would probably send the ball machine. Keep in mind, Peter, I want her to feel good about her strokes as soon as possible. Where do you think I would make that ball land? Zone one, zone four, way at the baseline. Probably if you want to make her feel good, three, right? Exactly. That. So I would make her, I certainly wouldn't scream a, a ball right, right off the baseline. That's not going to make her feel good. So most people would agree, yeah, that would be in the most comfortable spot. And then I would send it with a certain trajectory. I wouldn't make her hit a strike zone four ball or a strike zone one. If I really want her to play and feel good about herself, as soon as possible, I would make sure that most of her point of contacts are in strike zone three. So the way you make someone feel really good about their game is make your shot land in three and make them strike zone three. Right? Yep. Well, here's the paradox. By doing those two drills earlier, I already discovered on my own, without my coach having to tell me, that most of my shots land in three. And most of the strike zones are three. So the very way, write this down, the very way that most people play, unaware to them, is the exact way that is how you would want to make your opponent play better. So they're not even playing tennis. They're not even aware that part of the problem they're not winning is because they're playing wrong. They are hitting and they're judging the ball or the quality of like, I hit it hard and it went in, therefore I'm playing well. And this is where they missed the ball. I have a lot of ball strikers. Or let me ask it another way. If you've ever said to yourself, everybody listening in here, if you have students or yourself ever say a phrase like this, like, man, every time I play, so-and-so plays great against me. Or people are always training against me. There's a lot of tennis players that believe that, right? Well, those people don't understand that they are the problem. The very way they play is the way that makes other people play great. So that's why those awareness drills are kind of eye-opening. So I view it, my, the way I describe it is like you're a human ball machine. So you look at Mika down here at the bottom of the screen. She's my female player. Uh, she's a ball machine. And maybe her factory settings, most factory settings, when you come out, the human ball machines send the ball to three and, and send it with a certain arc to make the strike zone three. But that could be your factory settings. But it doesn't mean that you can't adjust your settings. So my goal would be to have Mika be able to just like a ball machine, change and send all kinds of stuff. And if I want her to play, I don't want her to her goal to be to hit well. I want her to win. So that means a whole other thing uh, of playing differently, being disruptive, using sabotage. And now we're starting to scratch the surface of level three tennis IQ, where you start saying, you know, it's not about me. I'm starting to look at the other guy, and I don't want them to hit the ball in strike zone three. They're really good. By the way, um, the, the reason I think this happens in the pro tour is because I look for it. And probably the most obvious example is um, Rafa Nadal. Rafa, when he plays Federer, has always had the same game plan. Always. It has always been loop it high and make Roger back up and preferably hit a strike zone four backhand above his shoulder. Is that not the way it's been forever? Oh, that's absolutely the way it's been forever. And, and, uh, you know, what you're saying right now, this reminds me of the course I just closed, Mixologist. And one of the things I point out in the first video is that 
everybody loves to go out there and just hit the ball solid. Like it, it, nothing feels better than hitting a solid ball, but a lot of times that solid ball you're delivering, it's got a certain height and bounce and depth and it's right into the other. So the other person's hitting the ball solid too. So you guys are both feeling great, but uh, absolutely yeah. not necessarily playing winning tennis. So this exactly. is really good stuff. Yeah, and that's part of level three is that you're actually paying attention to the other side and many players don't ever get there. So this depth coding uh, and the strike coding, I just showed you those two. I wanted to kind of tell you my ball machine analogy. So as a player, you have to have a ball machine. You know, I understand that some players have their factory settings, their preferred settings. Maybe Peter likes to whale and maybe I'm a natural slicer. Whatever is fine. I'm not trying to change people's entire game style. But at the minimum, you have to have the ability to change your shots, just like a ball machine would. Otherwise, you run the risk of just hitting well and making the other guy hit even better, and you're never really getting ahead. So let's go to this next stage. Uh, this is just a quick game. Um, you're going to spar back and forth. Peter and I are hitting. Um, and every time I hit, my body's going to be doing one of three things. I'm either going to be moving up. Even if I take one step up, I say up. And then if I back up, even if I put my weight on my back foot, I'll say back right when I hit it, or if I go lateral along the baseline plane, I would say stay. So saying up, back, stay, up, back, stay is a really another awareness game. It makes you aware of what actually happens with your momentum. And the takeaway here is that most people, before you ask them, what do you think is, you know, I explain the drill. I go, what do you think is going to be the most common? And they say, well, the most common is going to be up. I'm going to say up a lot. <clears throat> and in reality, back is what they say a lot way more than they realize and that's the big takeaway people walk away from this drill kind of like whoa i can't believe like eight out of ten shots i actually was on my back foot uh and if you do that properly it's not a problem but it's a kind of an eye opener um so level three this is the fun stuff so level three is all about your opponent's side of the court uh players learn that it's not about them i like to tell people that on the tennis court you're the second most important person uh, that's a really hard concept for a lot of people to, to understand because they think it's all about them. Um, here, the players look to improve tactically and not just technically. And sabotage skills or where you're becoming disruptive come into play at level three of tennis IQ. So um, <clears throat> here's the decisions that you're going to be looking at, at. Now your decisions expand. You're able to uh, do that level one, which you do in the ball. Level two, you're really aware you're aside. But now... You can include these things. You're aware of where your opponent is standing on the court. I understand that if Peter's back by the fence, that's way different than if he's way up in zone two. <clears throat> I understand my opponent's momentum, you know, and I can start focusing on that, and that's going to help guide my decisions. Uh, I know where the ball is landing on my opponent's side. Uh, I know what strike zone my opponent is hitting, and I'm aware of what's where he's good and bad, <clears throat> and also the difficulty of the shot that I have coming my way. So let's talk about this paradigm shift because the first level of tennis IQ is that's where the player um, recognizes that the benefits of lowering their opponent's play is um, rather than just raising their own. So let me just kind of put that in my new words. When most players play, <clears throat> hopefully you're winning most of your matches. And if you're winning, doing whatever you're doing, I would not say you change tactics. You just kind of do what you're doing. Do your plan A and go and ride that ship home and get the W. However, there's going to be a percentage of the time where you're playing and you're not winning. You're down 4-1. It's evident, hmm, I'm playing Peter today. I don't think this is headed my way. I'm still going to try hard. But when you have the opponent playing better than you at the moment, here you have two options, okay? And I think people only think of one. So 99% of rec players, when they're playing, when they're a little lower than their opponent, their opponent's a little bit higher at that moment, they think, well, I have to raise my level. So I'm losing. Uh, I'm down one quarter Peter, so I got to play better. So for most players, what that means is they're going to try to hit more winners. They're going to try to go for more lines. And in actuality, they might be halfway decent, so maybe they have a few more winners, but they also equally have that many more losers, and they can't. But this is where most people die. So I play. If I win, I'm happy. If I'm losing, I'm going to try to play better, which means I'm going to hit harder. Uh, and if I can't pull that off, then I'm just going to stay on that ship until it sinks and I'll lose. A much better way 
is to use sabotage or start thinking in reverse, where I'm not going to really raise my level because that's hard to do. I'm playing Peter. Chances are I'm trying my butt off. I'm trying to do everything I can. So another way of looking at it is to lower Peter's level. Okay, so the cool thing is we don't even have to wonder what it is. We all know some classic things that make people play worse. Uh, it's the types of players that we all complain about, moon balling, slicing, drop shotting, hacking. So if I go to the next slide, <clears throat> one of the ways I'd like to do this is by color coding. So this is a game, and this is one of my favorite games. We're going to hit back and forth with a partner, and you're going to color code. It's gonna, we're going to make sure that um, your decisions are correct. So just a quick system here. Yellow means any neutral ball. It's just your everyday ball. I'm in position, you're in position, I'm just going to stroke it back, I'm not looking to hit a winner, and I'm not wounded. Uh, red is when I'm in trouble. Uh, the power level is lower, maybe a two to five. And I define red as anytime I'm running into a corner desperately, or if I have to shorten my stroke because there's so much power coming in, that's the red. And green is quite the opposite. Um, power level seven to nine, on a scale of 10 that is. And now I'm probably going to try to to wound you. Maybe not had a winner, but I'm going to try to wound you. Um, probably my feet are inside the blue core. I've, I've gained a little better core position. So this color coding, you can do it for yourself, but I would recommend for level three, you do it for your opponent. So you see the bottom sentence there is you're going to focus on, on your opponent's side so the player is calling out what their opponent is hitting. Um, you can do it both ways. If you do it for your side and you call what you're hitting, that's level two of tennis IQ. It's about your side the court but this more advanced version is you're going to call your opponent and for many players i work with this is the very first time they're even at all considering the other side of the court so what you want me to do and it's it's a slow but very obvious um conversion that i start seeing for the first time while they're starting to get it they're starting to understand that they leave the ball short and their opponents are saying green a lot and that opens up a coaching moment you know say pete you know you're the other guy calls a lot of greens. That's not good for you. So how can we make them call less greens and we can open up that discussion? But this color coding drill has been around forever. I didn't invent it. I think I learned it literally in the 70s. But this is how I use it and how I deploy it to teach tennis IQ. Um, here's another one you can do. I do this one less, but I'm going to spar back and forth. And basically what I'm going to do is whatever strike zone my opponent is in, I'm going to call it out. So on the far side, the guy in the red, he would be calling out five because he's moved Mika, my female here, down into area five. So that's a fun game because you can start now saying, okay, 90% of the shots happen from zone five. And so guess what? Most people are really good there. So Peter, I noticed that when you push this person back to zone six, they leave a lot of short balls. So what could we do to make her go to six? And then bam, now we're... Again, starting to think quite a bit more smart. Um, missions. All right, so missions we talked about at the beginning. This is just my way of running a tactic or running a play. These are possible missions. So I would be sparring. Uh, Peter and I are hitting, and then I would pick one of these missions. My mission might be that first one, move Peter into zone six. Um, and Peter might pick a different one. Peter might say, okay, I'm going to pick the bottom one. I'm going to make three slices in a row. Uh, and then we'll spar back and forth. We won't tell each other, Peter, what we're doing. We're just going to try to deploy that. Uh, often if I'm coaching, I'm telling the players what to do, or I could just pick one and my buddy and I can spar back and forth. After a couple of minutes, you're going to come up and say, okay, um, what were you trying and what was I trying? And sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Here's a couple other ways to use missions. Um, player one could be trying to move the opponent to zone six, and player two could be trying to make the – um, extend the rally to six. So this is something you can take right to the core. If you're a coach or a player, uh, you can do this while you compete, or I would recommend doing it just while you're rallying. Just feed the ball in and try to pull off these missions. And all you're really doing when you add more missions is you're adding more tactics. So a tactic is just what you go to war with. If you're going to go and battle and you only have two or three usable things you can deploy, and Peter has seven, well, that really sacks the things in his way. But a lot of players, club players, they don't want to add stuff. They want to do what they do well, so they never 
accomplishing any more additions to their game. And I, if I had to define the play, the job of a player, uh, your job is to add more and more deployable tactics or missions as you get better. So that a year from now, you can do more than you could this year. The year after that, you can do more yet. The more you can do, the more people you can beat. Um, so quality points are getting near the end here. So I'm going to have my players play. This time I do have them serve. And if the way I like to do it is I would play against Peter. I serve four points and Peter serves points. But here's the difference. After each point, I'm going to ask the players to rate themselves. And the rating scale is this. Zero equals they, paid, they played a poor point. One point if they played an average point, And three points if they played a great point. So I'm looking for quality. Um, but what really happens here is this opens up a door. This has been more eye-opening for me than anything, doing this game with my players and then listening to how they grade themselves and realizing, wow, that is not even close. You gave yourself a two? That was a zero. Um, <laughs> here's an example. They're way back, and they hit a baseline or from the baseline, maybe even a zone five or almost zone six, way back. And they hit a drop shot, and it dribbles over the net, and it's a clean winner. Okay. They almost every rec player would say, Well, that's a two, man. That was the best shot ever. But I'm looking at the decision and saying, That was the stupidest thing ever to try. I will grant you that you won that point. But if you're going to try to make a living like this, I'm going to be upset because that was just bad strategy. Ah, cool. I didn't know that. Or, like you mentioned, they might play a great 20 ball rally and they hit a ball down the line because the opening's there and they hit it three inches wide. Well, a lot of times my players will rate themselves a zero. And I said, well, why did you say zero? Well, because I made an unforced error. They go, yeah, but what about the 13 shots before? They were all in the right spot. And the, the, that decision that you made was actually the right target. You just missed the shot. So that shows how often they tend just to uh, rate just the last shot. So this is a very interesting thing. Uh, at my club, we, have, we run a summer academy. Uh, when it rains, sometimes I show some stuff on TV. And here's what I did. Uh, this is Rafa and Roger. A few several years ago, um, I have some recorded footage of them at my club um, from the French Open. Okay, they had this famous 22-shot rally, and I'm watching it with our players. And I'll pause it. And, you know, what do you think about this? And I'll pause it. Like if I see Federer in that position where he stretched out, I'll pause it. And I'll say, What do you think is going to happen next? So there was one epic point that ended with. Um, Rafa hits a loopy ball, Federer backs up. It was like a 22-ball rally, and then leaves it short. Rafa moves forward inside the baseline, wails on a, a shot, and uh, he hits a winner. And I pause it, and I say, okay, players, what are your thoughts? And 90% of the comments were surrounding, well, Rafa hit that winner. That was a sweet shot. It was all about Rafa's winner. All right, then I rewound that point, and I said, players, we're going to watch this point again. And we're going to call yellow, red, green on behalf of the players. So we're all going to say it out loud. And the, it kind of went like this. It, it was yellow, 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 red, yellow, yellow, red, yellow, yellow, red, yellow, red. There's another red. There's a yellow. There's a yellow. There's a green. And there's a winner. And I'm like, now what do you think of that shot? They go, wow, there was a lot of reds in that point. So... What I don't want to have happen is have our players running to the wrong finish line. And I think that can happen very easy as a tennis player if you're not aware or if you don't have a coach that knows what's going on. Um, the, that point was the, – the thing I took away from that point was how much defense they had. They just fought like animals. They got all these balls back in, from these difficult positions. But yet, what's the player's takeaway? The one single green there was in the rally, that's all they remember. So if you think about it, um, that's the better way to look at it. Here's another um, you know, example where they had four shots, and um, you know that slide probably doesn't is, is redundant. So um, how do I do this? How do I train this though? Um, so training game. Remember the first game we were going to rally back and forth, and we I call I rate myself, Peter. So um, after the point's done, I say, well, I give myself a one, and you say, yeah, you give yourself a one. If you want to take this to level three of tennis IQ, it's you're going to play the same game. But now instead of rating me, after the point's done, I'm going to rate you, Peter. I'm going to say you deserve a zero, one, or two. 
and then you're going to say what I deserve. And what's the trick there? All we're doing is just giving not to the fight. fight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, but the trick there is I'm now forcing you to think about the other side of the coin. That's level three tennis IQ. Uh, to think about the other side of the court. Uh, that game is, man, those are two of my favorite games. These games, more than anything, have helped all my players. I'm not going to sit here on this thing and say, hey, 100% of the people I teach to have gotten better. But I'm getting 70% of the people I teach this to are really, for the first time ever, getting it. They're starting to uh, to make sure, like, wow, I, I think I'm learning how to actually play a freaking match of tennis here instead of just be a ball striker. This is just a, a little practice thing. I'm gonna. This is the giveaway. I'm going to give this whole slideshow away. But this will be uh, like a four-week lesson plan. Like if I was working with some kids privately, I might do this during my, my tennis lessons. Or if I have them on a team or if I'm a player, I'm going to take these and I'm going to do them with my partner just so I go out and practice with purpose. All the exact games are up above. We already went through them. But this is just a one sheet you can take to the court with you. Um, so Questions to consider as a pro staff, but also as a player. <clears throat> Are you spending enough time working on strategy and IQ? I think most players would admit they're spending almost all their practice time working on techniques, and they're kind of ignoring that. Uh, so you have players that uh, win more than the strokes they have. A lot of people would admit, yeah, I do have that. Uh, so there's some general questions there. But as a pro and as a uh, player, I think these are the deep questions you need to ask uh, so you're not spending – all this time kind of racing towards the wrong finish line. Um, and that's basically the PowerPoint. Um, and this is the PowerPoint that I'm going to be giving you all. So hopefully uh, that'll be a big benefit for you. But let me kind of get off of this thing here and try to go over here. You still hearing me, buddy? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you good. Yeah. Waiting so, for you to come back. Yeah, I'm trying to. Got to hit stop sharing. Anyway, guys, uh, man, I get a lot of feedback. But there you are. You're back now. As George is back, or Jorge's back. Uh, now's your time. And people, you got a lot of. Uh, first of all, I just want to give give a shout out to Jorge and, and our fans because a lot of them said, uh, "I'm going to share this with my coaches." Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so so many people really really liked this. Uh, love your ideas um and not just a, a receiving and not just sending awesome lesson this is great this is good stuff so really really great comments guys we really appreciate thanks a million we really appreciate all this now um i'm gonna put the uh the link here in the description in a second but uh, what are some questions you guys have uh, great information definitely going to work on those concepts Kristen stoddard okay awesome guys uh now is your time to ask some questions. Everybody's just saying great stuff right now. They didn't even have two thumbs up. No one's even asking a question because they just love it. I think you were so oh, uh, clear. Well, good. That means I'm getting better at delivering it. <laughs> this is great stuff, as usual, from you. How difficult is it to get players to go from level two to level three? And that's from Rick Willett. Yeah, great question. I think uh, here's what I uh, discovered that – you could be a level two player and still be quite a player. I think you could be a four or five player and playing only at that level. I think that's about the ceiling. Uh, I don't see 5-0 and higher players that don't use level three. Uh, so this, I think the number one thing as a coach is you got to start to explain it. First, you got to get buy-in. So my buy-in is just, you know, I hit on the pain points. I'll ask most of my juniors. I go, hey, listen. You know, Frank, are you uh, just simple question? Are you winning as much? Are you happy with how much you're winning? Well, 99 kids out of 100 said, no, no, coach. I think I should win more. I wish I could win more. I go, well, are you open to starting to learn some of the things that the pros do? Well, yeah, I'm open to it. So I would go there and have that sales pitch before we start and, and hit on those pain points. Because once someone, once you remind them of their pain points, like, man, I keep losing these matches I should lose or, Hey, man, another huge pain point people have is I, I'm good in practice, man, but I, I stink in a match. What's the hell's wrong with me? I can't connect the two. This is how you help people do it. So getting them to admit that, reminding them how frustrating it is when it doesn't go their way, 
opens the door, and they're going to be a lot more open-minded about doing it. And then just plugging in the system. Uh, this system, I've tweaked it and tweaked it and tweaked it. I've used the drills. I changed the drills to, you know, to be the most effective. And uh, as you know, I speak a lot at coaches conferences, and most coaches just eat this stuff up because they can sense that, yeah, you're right, man. A lot of my players just don't feel like they win as much as they should. Even I feel that about my players. So I'm, I'm going to try this, and it works pretty darn good. I would tell you 70% of the people are, are going to buy in. And all you need to do is win one match with your brain instead of your strokes, and that gets pretty addicting. The toughest sell is to high school boys because they are so convinced that it's all about strokes, man. I lost to that guy because he wailed on the ball and hit it much harder than me, so I, therefore, need a bigger, fatter forehand. And, um, but that's the good news. If, they can, if you can help them win even one time or even in practice win a few more points that they might normally – and never thought about winning that way, now you're going <clears> to <throat> have some success. So I think it's the, the sales job is epically important. Um, if you just dive into this and say, hey, we're doing this, uh, it won't work as well as if you remind them of the pain points and let them agree, yeah, I'm open to this. And by the way, you can show pretty easily how this happens at the Pro Tour. Rafa Nadal, all these guys are super good at level three. Rafa is the most obvious of what he does to Federer. Mm-hmm. Better is caught on though, right? This year, this year he's like, no That's way, right. man, I'm not backing up anymore. He's improved level four. <laughs> uh, okay, so great stuff there, Jorge. Uh, one thing, uh, I put the link, if you guys, I want you to notice, I put the link um, up and uh, right beside the chat so you can go in and get that. I'm going to put the link in again. So I'm just going to keep putting the link there. So you guys just click on that. Now, there's a couple more questions. Um, one said, uh, can you say more? This is from Jerry. Can you say more about reducing your opponent's level? Sure. So I call <clears throat> that whole idea, um, I have words for it. I call it sabotage. And um, what I learned a long time ago is, and I, I was the worst at this. When I played, if I was behind, it never occurred to me to make my opponent play worse. It was always about me playing better. And I did that for decades as a player. I just thought that's the way to do it. Well, it wasn't very many times where I could say, well, yeah, I could point to that day where I was playing average and then I decided to play better and I did. It's so hard to do that. It just doesn't really happen. So the way you make your opponent play worse is by doing the classic things that most people hate. Uh, moon balls, slices, drop shots. These are all things that make the other people play bad, changing the pace of, of your shot consistently, hitting it hard, hitting it soft, hitting it high, hitting it low. Many of those missions are basically that kind of practice. But here's what I find. Most people don't want to practice that. Uh, try to teach a drop shot to a high school boy. Uh, it's almost like insulting to them. Like, I'm not going to drop shot. I'm a really good player. Why would I drop shot? Um, last year at the, Austri or at the French Open, Djokovic in the first match, and the first set of the first match hit 11 drop shots. I remember this, the stat. I re remember writing that down. I go, if the best player in the world at the time can hit 11 drop shots in one set, well, how, how in the heck are you considering this as an option? So I think drop shots, slices, loopy balls out of the strike zone, uh, making them back up. You know, Think about being disruptive, and I would check out those uh, missions because many of them, our missions that are kind of fall in that category of sabotage. When I say move Peter back into zone six, that's a sabotage tactic. Generally, if I can get you hitting back from the back curtain, you're not going to be hurting me. As a matter of fact, you're likely to leave the ball short, and then that opens up more opportunities. I can take offense and, and go on offense, or from there, maybe I drop shot you. Uh, but here's what I would recommend. Um, just because you're adding these other tactics doesn't mean that you're changing your style okay so if i'm a certain volley or if i'm an aggressive baselander that's the way you should play that's the way you're came out of the factory those are your best settings however it doesn't mean those should be your only settings um when that happens that that's trouble so i think that whole area of sabotage or being disruptive is just completely overlooked by most club players but it's very very effective again if you win even one match that way you're going to love it and you'll do more of it but yeah, yeah that's, that's what I talk about. I, I think that's good. And, and I want to kind of piggyback on what you're saying. 
um, because so many people, I think this is actually more adults than kids, uh, you know, too, will go, well, I don't want to play that way. That's not even real tennis. If I have to play that way to win matches, I, I wouldn't even, you know, have fun. I don't even know how they enjoy it. And here's the thing. Uh, we've talked about it, it is so important and so much easier to get your opponents to play worse than rather than raising your level. But just because you're using these sabotage tactics doesn't mean that you are automatically going into winning ugly mode. In fact, you may end up doing more of what you want. If you're hitting everything, as Jorge says, in, in, in zone three on the tennis court and at level three to your opponent, well, they're getting in the zone. You may feel like, well, what's happening? I'm hitting the ball real solid today, and it's just like playing, you know, it's like I'm banging my head against a brick wall. Right. Because, because you're hitting a ball that feels good to your opponent. It feels good to you, but it feels good to them too. And when you start to add in these shots that no one wants to hit, that you don't want to play against, a high loopy ball, for instance, I think that's probably the best shot you can hit in recreational tennis. And you may think, well, now I'm turning to a pusher. Well, no, what you'll end up fine is here come the unforced errors from your opponent. Here comes the bad decisions. You're going to start getting a lot of more, more short balls, which will set up uh, easier winners. Or if you do like to come to the net, a, a much easier way to actually get to the net and then finish the point. So now all of a sudden you start implementing these tactics. You start going, oh, wow, I, I thought I was going to go into winning ugly mode. And now all of a sudden I feel like I'm a rock star out here too. So it right. can actually increase your level of play while at the same time bringing down your opponent's level. Yeah. That's a that's a great point you make. And the, the best way to do that is um, I'm a hard hitter. That's what I like to do. But I'm hitting hard to you and you're hitting all, I'm not getting short balls. I'm just entering the slugfest. But let's say I, I have the skill because I practice it to loop a ball high to your backhand and you back up. Well, almost for sure that ball is going to come back short. And now what? Now I get what I want, a ball that I like to hit hard and I can maybe angle off and play through the sidelines instead of the baseline. So that's a perfect example how that would play out. But, yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, I've learned over the years when I start to get players to um, add new things, they they get a little spooked and they think, oh, coach is trying to change my whole life here and, and, and re restructure my entire game. And, and it's really not. You should always have your – best way to play and that just matters right i mean the best way for chrissy ever to play was definitely baseline and the best way for martina navratilova was definitely not so it's hard to say that's right for you so i agree that it's all going to be different depending on the person um but i also agree that if you don't have some variety and you're just one of these stubborn people that i'm going to play this way no matter what darn it uh with no disregard or no regard for what you receive or what your opponent is good at uh, you're going to have a lot more losses than you need to have. Absolutely. We're just going to take a couple more because we are over the hour mark. Uh, but, you know, the people have still hung in there. We we have a lot of people still on the line. Yeah, thanks, and guys. and I like this one uh, message here is because uh, we have some coaches on here, I can tell. And one coach asks, would these drills be too early to use uh, to get started with juniors who are 8 to 10 years old? Um, no. As a matter of fact, in the old days, I would say yes, because they were playing with traditional equipment and they couldn't get a ball going. So as soon as I get players uh, to where they can rally, even if it's a bit ugly, uh, I'm going to start introducing um, strategy. Now, I might only teach them things like level two uh, when they're eight and ten, uh, but I'm definitely not going to just ignore it. So, yeah, that would be good. Uh, I have little players. Yesterday I was with a, a group of players I subbed in. They were second and third graders, so seven, eight year olds. They're on the foot, they're on a red ball, uh, on a you know thirty six foot court, and um, I literally we worked on um, you know opponent awareness. So they were doing themselves up back stay, little eight year olds doing up back stay, and they learned. And then I said, okay, what do you think happens if you make your opponent say back and you push him back? What are you, you going to get a deep ball or a short ball? I just asked them, well, it might be short. Okay, then what are you going to do? So we just kind of show them a little bit um so i think that age can learn this stuff i maybe wouldn't be teaching them hey aim for strike zone four on their backhand because they probably don't have the skills to send different shapes of balls back but i can definitely start out with level two uh which is when you're this part of the court you do this when you're you know your strike zones here you do that when you're in trouble 
um, you know, and you're backing up and, and you have a, a backhand strike zone four, that's about your side of the court, you're going to do this. And then hopefully by the nine to 10, you can start introducing uh, level three tennis IQ, making the opponent awareness. And then by the time they're 14, they're not only pretty good little players, but they actually have a clue on how to play the game of tennis. All right, very cool. Now, a little bit of uh, housekeeping here, Jorge. Uh, we have people who have opted in, so that's good. People really like this information. Cool. Um, and, and Michael says he's tried twice with two different addresses, no luck. I did fill out uh, your form just now, and it says you're in. The 31 PDF is on its way to his inbox. Check your inbox, make sure it's not in the spam folder. But I have not received it yet either. Do you know if there's a certain amount of time that usually goes by before the delivery? Yeah, will usually come in? it's a matter of minutes. But um, I can uh, I can check. For one thing, um, I'll have the emails everybody got, and I can send them a, another link. But uh, you might want to refresh it twice. Uh, we did test this a bunch of times yesterday. Kenny, can you test this for me? Uh, I got my guy testing it right now. Um, but yeah, if you go here, that's where you're going to be able to put the email in that you want us to send it to. And uh, as of yesterday, it worked pretty good. Are you seeing my screen, by the way, with these different links? Yeah, yeah, we see the links. And I've been putting the link in uh, probably a good nine or 10 times for you now. And uh, everybody is getting, I got your in, which I got, but see nothing in the inbox yet. Uh, everybody's having this, so this is this is maybe something to do with the delivery system, guys. This uh, is nothing that Jorge can really control, uh, but the good news is, is he is getting these email signups, and worst case is he can always just send a separate email. So you guys will get this at some point. Is that is that fair to say, Jorge? Yeah, if not, they can just reach out to me here, info at Tennis Drills, and I'll send it to him personally, but... Uh, let me, um, I'm going to try it again just so we can all be on the same page. And uh, when you put your email, get into access. Okay, of course, I'm using an email that's uh, already in there, so I'm going to try this again. And Are you guys uh, watching my screen? We're, we're, we're watching what happens. Yeah, so this is good right here, right? It says it's on its way. Yeah. You now let me log into one of my gajillion emails that I have. Yeah, I think everybody's getting the it's on its way, but yeah, we're well, not getting the delivery. Yeah, I'm going to go in here now. This is where it's coming to. Yeah, that's kind of the, the piece of the purpose. Right? Okay, so I'm going to check my spam folder in here. I uh, refresh a couple times. Yeah, but for sure we'll get this fixed. Obviously, that was the whole point, and one of the best takeaways of this thing is having the ability to do it uh, and have that PowerPoint. So um, I'll keep looking and making sure um, my guy Kenny is is actually on this right now. Uh, it's not in spam. I go here. Yeah, I can see. Yesterday when I tested it, it literally went out. I got it like within a minute. So, um, yeah, I apologize for that, but we'll make that fix so we don't leave you all hanging. <laughs> so Biz Ben Videos says, Pete, let's have these types of sessions weekly with a smiley face. So uh, uh, you did a great job today, and I'd like to do them more often. Uh, if you guys really follow me, you notice that I am somebody who believes in connecting with with other online coaches. Uh, I've done with Ian, Kevin Garlington. Uh, I've done some stuff with Clay Ballard, uh, Coach Coach uh, Krill from the Tennis Vo uh, Vault, uh, Brent Abel from Web Tennis. I mean, I really like to do these, so I'm going to continue to do more of these. And, uh, and uh, certainly, Jorge, if you had fun today, I'd love you to come back again and do some yeah. other stuff. Yeah, we can talk about a bunch of other cool stuff. So, yeah, another one would be good is how to practice. I had developed a ton because drills is my sweet spot, but <clears throat> I find that when players go out and practice on their own without a coach, it doesn't always stay productive. So I have a ton of stuff around that because I want to make sure I arm my own players. You know, that'll just increase their improvement dramatically. So, um, yeah, sorry about this link, but we're working on it right now. We'll definitely get it fixed.
Um, but yeah, I appreciate it, Peter. Hope uh, people got a lot out of it. And um, yeah, that was fun. That's great. So guys, we're, we're done here today. We had a good time. Uh, if, if you have trouble getting this, uh, I'm sure uh, Jorge has seen the emails come in and he will make sure that you he gets it out to you. His email address is, if, if you do want to reach out to him, if you're, if you're not getting it within a day or so, what, what, what is your email address that people can, uh, can email uh, to you? I would just go support, support. at capistanitennis.com. Um, support at, and I'm writing this down here in the chat section, capistanitennis.com. So, that is support at capistanitennis.com. That's in the chat section. So right. worst case scenario, you'll get to him. As you can tell, I think, through this whole interview that he's a pretty honest guy and really cares about you guys getting better. Uh, so just a couple of things. Uh, Jim says, thanks, Pete. You, you, you are the best. Uh, uh, Benjamin says, appreciate this, guys. Good job. Cool. Uh, Thank you, Alan. Guys. Alan says, thanks, Jorge and Pete. So pe people really loved it. You did a great job. And uh, that's it. Any Anything you'd like to say before we stop this broadcast? No, I appreciate it. If uh, you guys want more info from this kind of stuff, probably the best site is the uh, JorgeCapistani.com. That's the free member site. It's got all kinds of slow motion footage of the pros and all kinds of lessons. And if you're a coach, you might want to check out TennisDrills.tv. Uh, that's mostly just uh, drills. That is subscription based. The other one's free. But um, just a ton of content for you. Uh, I might get a note, an incoming note here uh, from my guy that's working on this link. Um, member. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so you'll see once you're on that Jorge Capistani, if they want to create a free account, they can get a couple of free courses. Um, all they have to do is create an account and not buy. You don't have to buy a course. There's a couple on there for free. But uh, I'll, I'll make sure everybody gets this link because I'll be uh, giving everyone's email. Uh, and then I'll send out, besides the system sending it out, I'll just send a personal email with a direct link so we can just kill it all at once. But do, do check your spam folders. Very good. And just, right, to, and, just, and just a joke, but kind of a serious joke. Buy, too, because that's how we eat food, guys. Okay? So... <laughs> 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 All right, uh, that's it. I'm going to turn off the broadcast. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and we'll see you on another one soon. Take care. Right. See you, everybody. Thanks, Pete.